As we run out of land and water, this metric will become quite important. Uh, what, what is the feed conversion ratio? What does it take to produce a pound of anything? How, how does feed affect what's produced on the other end? Well, for industrial systems of beef, for instance, it takes eight pounds of feed to produce one pound of food. Notice it takes up to 70 pounds of feed, whether it's grass or otherwise, for grass-fed livestock to produce one pound of beef. And of course, it's one-to-one -one for picking plants out of your garden and eating it directly. Well, my statement that grass-fed livestock use more water than grain-fed has caused more arguments than almost any other, any other discussion I've had with prominent scientists, but it, it's a fact. And here's the data, which takes into account all sources of water, green, blue, gray. Take a look for yourself. There it is, circled on the right. And then, of course, both types of livestock operations, grain and grass-fed, use 50 to, to up to 100 times more water than growing plants for us to eat directly. Now, about the Go Meatless on Monday campaign. If, <laughs> if you do this, if you go meatless on Mondays, presuming you're eating meat on the other days of the week, well, you'll be contributing to climate change, pollution, global depletion of our planet's resources, and your own health on only six days of the week, then, <laughs> instead of seven. You'll be creating a, a false justification for your actions on those other six days of the week. In other words, please, let's not rest on the laurels of what you're doing right only one-seventh of the time. Now, quantitatively, what does eating less meat really mean? We talked about that yesterday as well. Just in, the, in a little over an hour I've been speaking here today, over eight million animals were slaughtered for us to eat in that one hour, eight million. 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock we're raising. But during that same one hour, 354 children in the world have died from starvation. 6,000 acres of tropical rainforest were destroyed and replaced by cattle. And over 4 million tons of greenhouse gases have been dumped into our atmosphere by livestock. Therefore, I'm advocating a much different approach than what the United Nations and others suggest when they state we should eat less meat. Well, because with that approach of eating less meat, only 7 million animals will be slaughtered in the next one hour. And only 113,000 tons of grain will be wasted, leaving only 353 children in the world that will starve to death in that next one hour. Isn't that what less means? So unlike Mark Bittman and Michael Pollan and all other eat less meat advocates and food gurus, I think these numbers should be zero. I sure do, and it's, it's easily attainable. There's no magic involved. Nothing has to be invented. No new technologies have to be employed. It's simply with what we choose to eat. And now we're going to take a quick look at the food service section of the policy of sustainability for the entire University of California system. Why? Well, because it's a perfect example of how the efforts of well-intentioned individuals and institutions can be so very far out of alignment with reality because of the definitions they're using. So you tell me, is this sustainable? What about the items I just highlighted in orange? Are those sustainable? <laughs> how about their primary objective of 20% by the year 2020? <laughs> is that sustainable? I mean, who, who thought of that, Professor 20? <laughs> and it's not much better with campuses on the east side of the United States, is it? Taken right off the, I took this right off the dining services website at Harvard's School of Public Health. Amazing. Last year, Cornell became the first Ivy League school to be MSC certified sustainable. It's quite a distinct honor, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's right. Cornell has now joined other distinguished health conscious organizations such as McDonald's, <laughs> which is the first fa fast food chain to be MSC certified. Both examples of just how far away we are with steps toward true sustainability. So even at these prestigious universities, West Coast, East Coast, and those in between, they would certainly benefit from understanding and then adopting a more accurate view of sustainability and then translating it to their students, our future leaders, and to do it now. Otherwise, we'll continue floating around in a zone that I call pseudo-sustainability. That's exactly where we are today, never getting to where we need to be, but thinking that we're sustainable. Well, that's a, that's a very dang dangerous predicament to be in, to think that you're something, but you're not. And one more important definition that needs refinement, ethics. The ethical consideration of what we choose to eat. The topic of conscious eating 
has always been about animal rights, animal welfare, hasn't it? The, the life and death of other living beings that we consume, how they're treated. Ethics has always been about this. But I think it's time to view conscious eating or ethics in a much different and certainly a much larger context. Is it ethical, for instance, for any of us to eat food that causes the extinction of other species if we don't need to? Is it ethical for the vast majority of humans on Earth to cause or contribute heavily to irreversible climate change, loss of ecosystems, and resource depletion, while 2% of us are living our lives by way of food choice to protect Earth? Is it ethical for any of us to use our planet in a way that exacerbates world hunger and extracts the potential for future generations to survive? It also then becomes a a matter of social justice, doesn't it? The person sitting next to you who's eating steak, pork, chicken, cheese, fish, or eggs is taking away the resources that could be spread more evenly, more efficiently, and used to support the life of perhaps 20 or more people. Is it even ethical for 319 million Americans to impose their diet-related health care costs on the 7 million who choose to eat the right foods? So you see, it's time we rethink ethics. It, it needs to be framed much differently than just with animal rights. In fact, one of the chapters in my most recent book is titled, Why Should I Pay for What Everyone Else Decides to Eat? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? It makes a little sense to continue doing what our predecessors did in the late 1800s and early 1900s when we didn't know any better, and there were far less mouths to feed with more land and water to do so. Do, do any of you still use a, a typewriter or a feather quill pen? to write a message? Anybody using those? How about the Pony Express? Or, <laughs> or the Stagecoach to send those messages? Or to travel? And you thought the internet was slow. <laughs> well, what about candles or kerosene lamps to read with at night? Anybody out there still using those to read my books with at night? <laughs> well, why not? Why aren't you using these things? I'll tell you why. Because they're obsolete. That's why. We've outgrown them. They're inefficient. They don't fit. And so it is with all meat, dairy, and fish. The world on a global basis can no longer support the production of these things. Just like the typewriter, just like the stagecoach. We need to evolve past them and we need to do it today because the clock is ticking. Almost everything we do, every decision we make every day is based on our culture, what we've learned, what someone else has told us to be acceptable or necessary after realizing that, that bloodletting here <laughs> wasn't so healthy for us after all, we miraculously stopped, even though we've been doing it for more than 3,000 years. There are culturally driven practices that we are accepting today, especially with food choices involving all animal products, that are much more unhealthy for our planet and for us than bloodletting. And by all counts, we don't have 3,000 years to get it right. 